little green fingers. Melody Walker has been out and about. Let's see what she's got up to this time. So last week we had a chat with Linda Galvad at the Saxon Hotel Garden Sarapana about what you need to do to set up your vegetable garden, first of all. Now, because it's winter, <laughs> we're looking at winter veggies. Hence the hat, because one doesn't want to be too cold, especially when there's snow on the horizon. So we've gone off to find Linda again, because Jeremy needs to know about how to grow all these healthy, good foods. And we're going to find out what you should be planting out at this time of the year. So one of the biggest sellers in winter in South Africa, whether it be from seedlings or from seed, is Swiss chard. Why is it so popular? Firstly, Swiss chard is an all-year crop, so you can grow it in summer and winter. It also is a prolific grower. So when something is so popular, it's generally because it can, you know, there's many reasons, but one of them is that it can supply a lot of food over a long period of time because Swiss chard doesn't just grow um, for one season and then dies. It literally, you can keep the same plant in the same space for two years and it will keep fruiting, if I can put it that way. It keeps growing. The way to keep your Swiss chard, um, you know, over a long period is that when you harvest the leaves with any plant really that you're going to consume, you always harvest from the outside. So you pick the older leaves so that the middle, which is the growing part of a plant is left to continue to grow and it's you know it's very good for you um, the common name for Swiss chard in South Africa is uh, spinach a lot of people call this spinach it's known as spinach but it's actually Swiss chard and it's also moroch and moroch yes. is one of the things that people like growing and there's so many different things that come under the banner of moroch not just Swiss chard I'm so glad that you mentioned that Mel because um, as you well know mustard is also considered a moroch, as is amaranth, and as you said, there are quite a few plants that are considered the moroch. Onions, radish, red tatsoi, green tatsoi, bok choy. as is the case with beans and broad beans are now you can eat broad beans the whole plant this, this one is a pink flowered broad bean which means that the bean inside the pod is a pinky red color as opposed to the other broad beans that you see in the background over there with a white flower and those the beans inside are green the thing about broad beans is they are Aphid catches almost. Aphids absolutely love them. And you can see around the top of this broad bean, there's a whole bunch of aphids collecting on the side. Um, what you have to do to prevent aphids from becoming a pandemic is you have to pull off the top flower. So you've got to pick it out like that. So you pull it off and you throw it away. That generally prevents the aphids from coming back to the broad bean plant because that top flower actually attracts the black aphid. So when you see that your plants are big enough and you've got a lot of flowers on them, you can then remove the top flower, which is at the apex of the plant right in the middle. You remove that top flower. Linda, one of the best crops that you've got growing up here at the moment, and it's something that I don't think, I don't know how many people actually grow them because they think, oh, well, pea pods and maybe my kids don't like peas, but they are fantastic. Tell us a bit more about this variety you've got here with you. So this is called a golden sweet pea. It's quite rare. Um, it's yellow, which is so amazing. Here's one. Um, I'll just pick it. And it's a sugar snap pea. It's sweet and delicious. Um, and I can say that we've got four different pea varieties growing here. We've got purple peas, the golden sweet yellow, um, and another mange too called a giant, it's, it's a giant sugar snap. It's the most fantastic, fantastic 
flavor some pea. I don't know how children couldn't like peas because they're so sweet. There's nothing else to them really, just their sweetness. Fantastic thing about peas is that there are, there are two types. The one is a dwarf pea and generally those have a white flower, um, but the climbing types will certainly the purple, these and the uh, green ones. They give you a beautiful purple flower with a much more crimson inner. They, they really are magnificent and the pea plant you can eat the whole plant you can eat the the leaves the tendrils are really fancy when you put them in salads obviously the pea and the flower if you pick the flower you aren't going to get a pea but um, there's quite a few flowers on here this variety particularly what's interesting is that the colder it gets the more prolific it gets do they need any special attention uh, peas belonging to the legume family create their own nitrogen uh, they're called nitrogen fixers, but once again, we always start all our plants in the most fantastic organic compost, and that just gives them the best start to life. Because if you wanted to grow a climber in a pot, we just give it a bit of trellising to climb up. Yes, uh, peas, peas are tendril growers, uh, unlike beans, beans twine. So if you put um, a couple of a bamboo sticks in a pot, you know, in a teepee shape for beans, that, that will be really easy for them. But with peas, you need to create you know, something for them to hook onto uh, with their tendrils. So if you look at this trellis, we've got multiple poles going across, but in between, we've actually got some twine so that they have something to hook up as they grow. They really grow up anything. You can put a, you know, a diamond cut fence, you can put chicken wire, you can put netting. Peas do have to have netting like most vegetables to protect them. They definitely are pigeons favorites. Peas are pigeons favorites. I've noticed that there's a lot of flowers in this garden as well. I thought it was supposed to be a veggie garden. Flowers are an imperative because we need to attract as many pollinators and beneficial insects as we possibly can. So um, people always overlook the fact that vegetable gardens or any gardens um, do have pests. You'll always have pests. So I always say that variability brings stability. If you don't have pests in your garden, then there won't be food for things like ladybird larvae. And ladybird larvae, which looks nothing like a ladybird, is a ferocious consumer of aphids. If there's a pandemic in your garden, in other words, when you see a lot of a pest, that's when you have to take, you know, external control, if I can say that. But generally, having beneficial insects like hoverfly, lacewing, ladybird, praying mantis, and then of course your pollinators like bees and butterflies are really important to create stability in your garden and obviously the profusion of what you see around you is because everything has its place. Perilla is a very special plant. It has massive medicinal value. It's also used as a mosquito repellent. You can rub it on your skin, but the red perilla, we've got green perilla as well. The red perilla is particularly rare and um, perilla generally has antibacterial, antifungal properties. And when you eat sushi in Japan, they will always serve the sushi on perilla because of its antibacterial properties. One of the things that you saw overseas is that um, a plant which most people think is, well, a bit of a mission to grow and not really worth it, is the artichoke. And I think that they are one of the most amazing plants because of their architectural value. Apart from the fact they taste so fine. What have you got growing here? I mean, they're almost as big as you. So these, there are two kinds of artichokes over here. The one is a green globe, which is rounder and it's green and the other one is a violetta precoce which is more oval shaped and it's the most exquisite purple color they flower in summer um, and in winter they actually die back so you don't see this magnificent you know these green silver green leaves and yes they are definitely used as a 
architectural plant, as you said, you know, they often used as a backdrop in an English garden or any vegetable garden, even in a um, normal garden, not a vegetable garden. They are really exquisite because of the shape of the leaf and the color and the statuesqueness of the plant. Um, what I saw at Kew Gardens when I was there recently is they, in one of the main walkways, they had these wooden benches, you know, every so often that people could sit and admire the surroundings. And around the benches were these magnificent artichoke plants. So it, it created like a private alcove. And because they're so big and they grow so tall, they really offered that coziness um, around these benches. They were really beautiful to see. Linda, when it comes to gardening, you are the person I know who's got the most hints and tips and tricks on how to make things grow wonderfully. What is your favorite thing and the best thing that you've ever taught anybody about creating a productive vegetable garden? Wow, no. <laughs> One thing. Um, I must say I always start with soil. Soil is definitely key. And I, I really try and, you know, hit that home because without putting your garden in a place where you, you're going to give your plants the best chance to succeed, you've got to give them the right kind of soil. But in terms of a lot of tips, you know, shadow. Watch what the shadow does in your garden in summer and winter. It's really important. Uh, trees that are deciduous sometimes offer you a space to grow in because there's a lot of sun there in winter whereas in summer you know there definitely isn't that space so shadow is important watch things like buildings next door to your home if they three stories or two stories or a high wall that will create a shadow um, another thing is watering watering is an imperative one to save water as you well know Mel you speak a lot on water conservation and the two things that I would say are primary when it comes to vegetable growing and water. Um, if you are in a place where water is definitely a, a big problem, being in a semi-arid country, water is a big problem. Um, you should grow crops that are fast growing, that fruit in a very short period of time, and also things that grow lo low to the ground. So instead of growing, for example, climbing beans, you grow dwarf beans because it takes the plant a much quicker period of time to give you food. Mulching is also a very good way to preserve water because it keeps the soil moist underneath the mulch. It doesn't allow the sun to dry it up. And lastly, watering is, I can honestly say this, put an irrigation system in. It could even, when I say that, it could even be, um, and this is what we often use in my own garden, I use it, a timer that works on a battery um, that's connected to a Host pipe with a waterer that has a 360 um, radius and ability, it swivels. My garden is very small, so it can have that. Um, putting your watering on a timer is so good for you and your garden because a lot of people superficial water, so they'll stand in one place for five minutes and they'll think that there's enough water that's gone into the garden whereas it will just be surface water and it won't be good for the plants and of course um, watering religiously at the same time uh, is very important because when you have watering that is not constant it affects the plants massively and it makes them um, diseased and then you're going to get disease vectors like aphids and whitefly and that will ruin your garden for you. Always fascinating. Always, always fascinating. Melanie Walker with our gardening show right here on Mansfield Today. Thank you for watching and uh, join us tomorrow for Mansfield Today.